From 1980 to 1989, eight Friday the 13th films were released by Paramount Pictures. For years, the studio tried to work with New Line Cinema to bring both the unstoppable killer Jason from the Friday the 13th franchise and Freddy from New Line Cinema's Nightmare on Elm Street series to the screen together. The concept seemed like a natural extension for the respected ghouls since it was popular back in the 1950s to bring classic horror monsters together such as Frankenstein, the Wolfman, and Dracula to battle each other for our entertainment. The roadblock to the grudge match of the century has always boiled down to rights, and the fact that these two horror icons reside at separate studios was a big enough hurdle to keep the two from going head-to-head -head for nearly two decades. In 1993, though, New Line Cinema had bought the rights to Jason Voorhees, with the intent to bring the two slashers together finally. Only, that would take another 10 years to happen. As we covered in our video on the Friday the 13th series, it would take several efforts to get the two together on the screen, even though they were at the same studio now. For some, the prospect of Jason finally being able to fight Freddy was an enticing one for fans, but some were just happy that Jason was at a studio that most fans felt would fit him better than his former home at the stuffy corporate Paramount studio. New Line at the time was known for being one of the most successful independent studios in Hollywood and would soon be folded up into Warner Brothers via a Turner buyout. The studio was known for being very horror friendly besides being the home to Freddy Krueger, so many fans were on board with Jason's new home. After the success of Freddy's Dead The Final Nightmare in 1991, bringing a close to the original continuity in the Nightmare on Elm Street series, the studio acquired Jason to promptly kill him off to many's confusion. Jason Goes to Hell would hit theaters 25 years ago on August 13, 1993, opening to a very impressive 7.5 million. Jason Goes to Hell would go on to gross 15 million at the domestic box office on a $3 million budget. And though it would take a few years, the movie set the stage for Freddy vs. Jason down the road. Sean S. Cunningham, who had not been hands-on with the series since it had began, was now producing and decided he wanted the supposed Final Friday to be different than the first eight films. So he tapped a young and up-and-coming director named Adam Marcus to kill the horror behemoth. A native of New York and Connecticut, Adam Marcus started working in film very early on. At 11, he was a PA on his first studio movie. At 13, he was an apprentice editing at Columbia Pictures. At 15, he created the Westport Theater Works Theatrical Company, directing and producing over 50 shows in seven years. At NYU, he won Best Picture for his film, So You Like This Girl? At 21, Adams set up his first feature film at Disney, and less than a year later, he had been hired to write and direct New Line Cinema's Jason Goes to Hell, The Final Friday. At 23, he was the youngest director ever hired by a major studio to write and direct a feature film. He then turned his attention to writing. He and his writing partner, Deborah Sullivan, wrote scripts for Paramount, Fox, and Lionsgate. In 1995, Adam created the Skeleton Crew Theater Works. In 1998, Adam directed the indie film Let It Snow, starring Bernadette Peters. Adam then directed the Sony Pictures feature film Conspiracy, which he co-wrote with Sullivan, starring Val Kilmer, Jennifer Esposito, and Gary Cole. The latest Marcus Sullivan project, written by the duo, is Momentum, starring Olga Kurilenko, James Purefoy, and Morgan Freeman. He and Sullivan have recently partnered with longtime producer Brian S. Sexton to form Skeleton Crew Productions. They already have several films slated for release next year and two television series slated for mid-2019. As a director, Adam has three new films in the pipeline, The Plantation, The Harvest, and Dread. His most recent film, Secret Santa, is a return to the genre Adam loves dearly. In the second of a series of interviews on the subject of Friday the 13th and Jason, it is my great pleasure to talk to Adam about that and so much more today. Thank you so much for joining us here on Midnight's Edge. Adam? It's absolutely my pleasure. And what made you first want to get into film and television? What, what, <laughs> what got you going? Uh, well, it's a combination of things. My, my whole family is in the arts, so um, everybody was either an actor or singer, a lot of Broadway performers in my family, um, and even one filmmaker, uh, Joe Ellison, who uh, wrote and directed Don't Go in the House back in the early 80s. So, so there was a bit of a legacy in my family. Of course, my family wanted me to have nothing to do with the business because they were all in the business and knew how tough it was. <laughs> Um, so uh, I ignored all of that and uh, became best friends with a kid named Noel Cunningham when I was very young. Sounds familiar. 
It, it, yes, and his dad, of course, is Sean S. Cunningham. So um, I got kind of sucked into that family's dynamics and really fell in love with everything they were doing and working on. And so I ended up just being sort of that annoying kid who was always around and always involved in some way. And I, I, I have to say, I was most inspired by his mom, Susan Cunningham, who's a brilliant film editor. And she was really kind of a person that I gravitated towards as far as, you know, how movies worked and the breakdown of film. And, and I just found all of that incredibly fascinating. But, you know, I mean, at that time, Wes Craven was always there at their home and Steve Miner. And so this would have been in the earlier days, right? This was in the late 70s, early 80s, right when Sean was about to make Friday 13th and then went on to do, you know, Strangers Watching Spring Break, House all of that. So it was just a really exciting, cool time to, to be around them. In the meantime, look, you know, I mean, when I was nine years old, I saw Star Wars uh, on its second day of release. And like many filmmakers of my generation, the minute the Imperial Destroyer went over our heads, I said to my dad, who was sitting next to me, and he'd already seen the film Friday night at the opening, took us Saturday morning. And I, I just said, I want to do that. And from that moment forward, I never did anything but things that would get me closer to that just didn't look back yeah 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 and so for me you know from that moment i started doing a ton of theater as an actor and then as a director and choreographer and producing my shows and writing stuff and you know so i was it, it was right at that moment when that started to happen and you know by the time i was 15 i was working for four different theater companies and then started running my first company and then i had a second company that i created so i i loved it i i, I loved it i loved the world of actors i loved being creative in that way i loved putting on a show that was something about having an audience's response to, to what you're creating that was intoxicating. And so that became sort of the thing. And what's incredible is that the theater company that I ran was so remarkably successful. And remember, I, you know, I grew up in between Manhattan and Westport, Connecticut. And the thing that was amazing about Westport, you know, Sean Cunningham lived there <laughs> because it was like an artist's safe haven. Paul Newman lived down the street. Martha Stewart was at the other end of town. Neil Simon. Here's the thing. And it was a place where, I mean, like, Paul Newman was very specific in the way that he wanted to be treated in town, which is, you know, he would never sign an autograph. He did not want to be Paul Newman. He wanted to be just somebody who lived there and was your neighbor. Right. And what was remarkable about Westport is that everybody treated everybody that way. There was just a common sort of like, oh, there's Paul Newman shopping for pumpkins. That was just the way it was. And so there was nothing unusual or weird or <gasps> about it. You know, it was just very um, comfortable. So I grew up around people like that and never got intimidated by them. It was just sort of those were your friends and neighbors. And so with that, you know, the the it, even in the public <laughs> high school that I went to at Staples, the theater program paid for all of the sports. We made so much money as a theater because we look, we I I grew up in a 1400 seat theater with a, an incredible proscenium arch and a full orchestra. And I mean, we had all of this stuff and we were so financially successful that we were the ones paying for all the other programs. It's kind of crazy, right? And then when I started my own theater company, we were so financially successful that a tremendous amount of that allowed me to go to college and paid for a lot of my schooling and paid for my student films. So, you know, I had this kind of amazing education in the theater. Now, mind you, nothing was handed to you. You had to work for all of this. So, you know, you struggled to make these things successful and, and you know, and, and creative and, and all that. But when you did do good work, you ended up getting rewarded in a way that was, um, you know, that enabled to open other doors because I did not grow up a rich kid. Westport was a very rich town. I was not a rich kid. I was, you know, I was the only guy in my senior class who didn't have his own car. I, I, I didn't even have a driver's license, for God's sake. So I was never that kid, but I learned how to work the system and make things work for me so that I could go to things and be in places where I could experience that life that a lot of these other people who did have Hollywood money and so on could. So I went to NYU. I won Best Picture at NYU. And it was a comedy. It was not a horror film. It was a comedy at NYU. And right after that, Sean Cunningham saw the film and invited me to Los Angeles to, um, you know, to be his bitch for a year. And he would give me my shot. You know, th there, there were things that you would think would work for you and then worked against you. Because, like, <laughs> I spent from nine years old on 
wanting this and working towards it. From 11 on, I was working jobs in film or theater. I mean, I was just working. So I was earning money from the time I was 11 as someone in the arts. So when people go like, ah, oh, he's 23, what the hell is he doing directing a movie? It's like, well, wait a second, wait a sec. If I was 34, would that have been acceptable? And most people would say, of course, of course, because you would have paid your dues. I'm like, well, if I started working in my early 20s when I got out of college and I made it at 34, that would have been the exact same amount of time from when I actually started working to when I directed my first film. So people don't want to put that together mentally because it's like to, the, the young age. Look, here's the thing. Since I was 16, I've been middle aged. I mean, that's really true. Like, since I was 16, I was this guy who I negotiated deals for hundreds of thousands of dollars to come into our high school to refurbish our theater. And I was doing that at 16, 17, 18 years old. So that's the person I was. Before Sean gave me a picture to direct, before I got to do Jason Goes to Hell, I had already set up a movie with him at Disney. Right. You know, as a producer that Dean Laurie, the brilliant Dean Laurie wrote. And that would have been the one that became uh, My Boyfriend's Back eventually? That's the one, that's the one. It was originally called Johnny Zombie. I had brought this project out to LA to direct called Johnny Zombie, and it was something that I developed with Dean Laurie for years while we were in school together. The first thing about Johnny Zombie was it was hardcore R-rated horror comedy slash musical. I kid you not, there were songs. And I had gone out and worked with a production designer and done, you know, full production design for the film and costume design. I mean, we had this thing ready to go. So by the time I got to LA, I had a significant book on this movie and Sean read the script, hated the script, but loved the title and was gonna give me a million and a half to go produce it in Connecticut, which was like my dream. Like that's what I wanted to do, but he wanted to hire a different writer. And I said, then I'm not gonna sell it to you. Which again, I'm 21 telling Sean S. Cunningham, I'm not <laughs> selling you this movie, which is, you know, ballsy and, you know, probably pretty stupid. But I was loyal to my friend Dean. And I said, look, Dean's a brilliant writer. Get his butt out in LA, give him six weeks to rewrite it. And if he doesn't do what you need him to do, then we can hire another writer onto the project. And Sean agreed, totally agreed. And Sean let us go to work. And when Dean delivered the, this new draft, Sean was so in love with it, so impressed by it, that we started doing readings for the studios. Next thing you know, Disney wants to make the movie. For me, I was like, wait a second, who wants to make the movie? Because it's not the Disney of today. It was the Disney of the early 90s, you know, when many call Disney the unhappiest place on earth. But this wasn't even through Miramax or Dimension or anything like that either. Oh, no, no, no. This was Disney proper. Right. And I immediately saw what they were doing to the movie. I mean, they truly wanted to get rid of the zombies. Right. Zombies weren't the, the mainstream thing they are now, for sure. Absolutely. Well, and the other thing is, the movie that, that Dean had, had crafted was, and why I loved the movie and where I kept steering it, was that the zombieism of it was actually equated to the AIDS epidemic. Because the zombies, the zombies were not flesh-eating monsters, they weren't these maniacs. It was about this group of people who live in the cemetery who desperately want to go home to their families. And when they do, because Johnny is brave enough to go out of the cemetery, when they go back to their families, their families react as though they're wholly different people because they look different. And Dean and I, you know, we were in the, in the 80s, I was going to school in the 80s in New York City, and the AIDS epidemic, you literally saw people turn on people because they had, you know, some, some kind of scabby marks on their face. And suddenly they were a monster and shunned. And we were like, wait a second, this is the same person. What are you doing? So we were making this kind of cool political movie, by the way, in sort of the Romero mold. In right. like, we wanted to do a horror comedy. I mean, not, not the Romero like comedy, but when Disney got a hold of it, I knew exactly the movie they were going to make, and they did. They neutered the movie, and that's fine. And look, people love that movie, and I, that's great. Anybody who grew up with it, you know, when I say my boyfriend's back, anyone who was a teenager in those years goes, oh my God, I love that movie. I'm like, okay, good. And I came to Sean, and I said, look, I said, we've got Johnny Zombie going. All of that is great, but. I'm not directing this. This is nuts. It doesn't make any sense. It was going to be a big Disney movie. They were going to spend a ton of money on it. I'm like, no, 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 no. I said, I, I just want to make a small movie. I want to do something out of the gate that's controllable, that I can make a statement with. And Sean said, well, 
He said, uh, New Line is buying the rights to Jason from Paramount. And he said this, I will put my hand on a stack of Bibles. He said, get rid of that fucking hockey mask and I'll let you write and direct it. And I will tell you, there are there's a YouTube video of him calling me a fucking liar at a convention. And the minute he realizes that he just said that, you watch him, he backs, he backs off on his own statement. He starts going, well, Adam was very creative and he had a different idea in my... He totally starts trying to kiss my ass right after he tells me I'm a fucking liar. Quoted, supposedly quoted, that Mr. Cunningham, you said to director Adam Marcus at some point during the production, quote, please do something about the damn hockey mask, unquote, uh, which would seem to indicate maybe you weren't a fan of kind of where the character had, had come to uh, evolve at that point. Just wondering if that's true, and if so, could you elaborate? It's a fucking lie. <laughs> Outside of, outside of that's a good story, but no, we um, <laughs> the mask was was there to stay. I, Adam had some other things he was trying to do, but the mask uh, ultimately saved our ass in that movie. And here's the thing, you know, with um, w w I've got a new film out, a film coming out called Secret Santa that uh, we've been all over the world um, at festivals with. And invariably at festivals during Q and A's, I get questions about this very moment. And I always tell everybody, I say, I tell the audience, take out your phones. Take out your phones, post this shit to YouTube, Facebook, wherever you want it. I say, and I say, here's my response to Sean Cunningham calling me a fucking liar over that statement. So one of two things is true. Either a 21-year-old boy who just got out of film school told Sean S. Cunningham, a 53-year-old man, who created Friday the 13th and the House franchise and a ton of other things. I told him what he was gonna do with the hockey mask. I told him what he was gonna do with Jason. Or he told me to get rid of the fucking hockey mask. Now, here's the thing. One of two things is true. That either means that I am the most powerful 21 year old who was ever born into existence and Sean Cunningham is a eunuch or Sean Cunningham is the liar. So he can choose either one. I'll take either one. Either I'm exonerated for being a liar or I am the single most powerful young man to ever hit Hollywood. So either one, I'm cool. I'll go with either, with either scenario, I'm fine. So was there any demands from the studio or how did they feel when they found out that Sean's kind of ultimate goal was to get the goalie mask out? Um, I gotta tell you, I never got a complaint from the studio either. And look, here's the other thing. I'm not stupid. I wanted the mask to come back at the end of the movie, and I brought the mask back. And so uh, that was always going to happen. My goal was to take the character that you love so much and make him more special. So Jason's in the whole movie, but I knew if I hold that hockey mask back from the audience, because look, I'm a fan of the movies. I love the hockey mask. I want the hockey mask to come back in. So for me, I knew if my third act is the return of Jason, the audience is going to lose their freaking minds. And by the way, they did. So... All of that worked. And again, you know, I had to drag Jason to hell by the end of the movie. So I knew the hockey mask had to come back just so that it could be brought to hell. Right. So how did the initial idea, though, then come about for Jason Goes to Hell? He obviously told you that they were getting the idea, just get the mask out. So is, was that the only stipulation that you were given? That was the only stipulation at first. And the thing is, what I delivered to Sean originally, which, by the way, he bought, because I, I brought him a treatment three days later and he bought it. He was like, done. This is great. I love it. Let's let's go forward. It had problems, <laughs> many, but he was excited at the direction I was moving in. Right. This was like the first time Sean was in, involved in the series, though, since like the first film, right? It really is. I mean, here's the thing. Sean is a um, producer throughout all of these movies, meaning he collects a check every time they would make a Friday the 13th movie. And here's the thing, on part two and part three, because Steve Miner directed them, Steve Miner was Sean's protege ever since Last House on the Left. And by the way, Susan uh, Susan Cunningham cut part two. She was the editor of part two. And she, again, she's a brilliant editor. And I think part two is the best edited of all of them. So he had a tenuous connection to those movies, but not much of one. So then how did the whole sale come about? Because he was the producer all this time and technically owned the rights, yes, that's how he got involved again? Then? Let's put it this way. At the point when I when I was with Sean, Sean was just desperately trying to get things made. 
okay? It was the early right. 90s. He hadn't had a hit in many years. And Sean likes having, you know, big houses and pools and cars and things. And so in order to do that, he had to keep making movies. And look, here's a, here's the thing about Sean Cunningham that most people don't know. Because I asked him at one, because he, I remember he was asking myself and Dean, we were all up at his house in, in uh, Beverly Hills. And he was asking us, you know, what our goals were, what our dreams were. And, you know, we told him our kind of 21, 22 year old dreams. And then I turned around and Sean and I said, what are your dreams? And he said, to win an Academy Award. And this is Sean Cunningham. I mean, this is, you know, the master of the exploitive who really wanted to be taken seriously as a filmmaker. And he had some scripts that were really cool, that were really like dark and interesting indies that weren't violent, that were about sort of the human condition. And he really did want to make those movies. The problem is, you know, the film industry of that period in particular, once you were in a box, you were in a box forever. That's it. And the problem is Sean's box had a hockey mask on the cover of it. And so Sean was only seen as the guy who made these movies. Right. He wasn't like Wes Craven where... Right. But here, here's, the other, here's the other problem, okay? The one other problem is, if you look at Wes Craven, Wes Craven really wanted to keep making things like Serpent in the Rainbow and Music of the Heart. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But he couldn't because... Because he's Wes Craven. Exactly. Yeah. And it's like people forget that these filmmakers are so multifaceted, but were never given a chance to really do the stuff they could do. And Sean, because his name didn't mean as much as a Wes Craven, Wes Craven could get a Meryl Streep to say yes. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Sean couldn't. And and look, and I feel bad for him, but again, we all kind of make our own cages to some degree. So Sean, you know, he wanted the mask out, mostly because I think that mask represented his whole career. And he, you know, if we could blow up the mask, we could change his trajectory. Right, and he had very little to do with that version of Jason, if anything, in the first place, is kind of my understanding Absolutely. as well. Absolutely. He made, he made a movie about a vengeful mother taking revenge for her child's drowning because campers were fucking instead of watching after her son. That's it. Right. That's what he that's what he did. And there is an argument in court right now that he even had very little to do with that as well with the whole Victor Miller situation. I don't know how much you know about that or want to um, comment on know, that, but I know I know a bit about it. Look, here's the thing. Um having been an artistic person that worked for Sean and the way I ultimately was treated by Sean and look, again, Sean, I am I am grateful forever to Sean for giving me my big break to start my career. Absolutely. Did I make Sean a lot of money in return? Yes, I did. Yes, I did. Did Sean profit from my work? Yes. Did I profit from the fact that Sean believed in me? Absolutely. That being said, the way I ended up being treated is the way most creative people who work for Sean end up being treated. And so when I hear Victor's argument, I've seen Sean do stuff like that. He does not, let's put it this way, Sean doesn't want to call me as a character witness. Right. <laughs> and by the way, when you know I made my first independent film after Jason Goes to Hell, when I made Let It Snow, Sean called me after my Variety and Hollywood Reporter reviews came out, which were both raves. He called me at home and left me a message saying, hey Adam, I just want to tell you, boy, good job. So I thought we were cool. Right. And then I see this nonsense. And I was, and by the way, look, even some of the stuff that he said in the book, Crystal Lake Memories, I, I just scratch my head and go, you know, Sean, um, you were the producer of the movie. You were there every day. You were there. You didn't do much. You didn't say much, but you were there. And it's almost as though Adam delivered a movie to me. What? Again. I was 23. <laughs> it's not like it's not like he suddenly said, "Hey, let the kid from summer camp just make the movie." I, it, it just didn't work that way. I had him sitting on my colon the entire time I was making the film. So every decision was put past him. Every choice was put. There was one choice I made that wasn't put past him. He almost fired me over it, and we were eight days away from finishing the movie because of one choice I made that I didn't consult him on, which was. We did not have a lake in the movie, okay? We faked a lake, like many of the Friday 13th films, we faked one. So what we did was, we, I used stock footage at the beginning of Jason Goes to Hell, you see the lake, you see Camp Crystal Lake. Um, I used stock footage from the first movie that ironically we got from Paramount. So I had footage from 
Sean's original DP of the late, okay? And it's beautiful stuff. But here's the thing. I kept saying, look, <laughs> at some point, we got to bring the lake back into the movie. Like, Jason was, you know, gestated a lake, born from a lake. All of this lake shit's got to come back into the movie. So at the end of the film, it, when we're in the Voorhees house and my brother's head gets cut off, when uh, when when uh, Stephen Freeman slashes his throat and his, you know, Randy's neck opens up, right. I wanted there to be a light effect in the room. And my cinematographer, Bill Dill, who was a genius, who's just a brilliant, brilliant guy, um, we worked it out that this light effect would happen. And I said, I want it to look like ripples on the water, the way when light hits water, it looks like ripples. Right. And so if you watch from that point to the end of the movie inside the Voorhees house, literally there are ripples like the lake has opened up in the house. I see. Okay. By the way, it is a subtle light thing. It's just a cool looking light design. When Sean saw this in dailies, I am telling you, he lost his effing mind. <laughs> he went berserk. He called my cinematographer in to yell at him. He called me in to yell at him. And in fact, he even said to my DP, he says, you know what you're doing. You should have been on, on Adam about this. And Bill was like, um, dude, I'm sorry. Adam's the director of the movie. What are you talking about? Right. Like, he, he made an artistic choice, and I stand behind him on the artistic choice. I think it's great. And Sean threatened to fire me, and I said, go ahead. Go ahead. We got one week of production left. Go ahead. Fire me. See if this crew stays. Whole crew's going to walk out with me. It was ridiculous. So let's go back to the beginning then. So after the, the three days you presented the treatment, how different was that treatment from the film in the end? <laughs> Very. <laughs> very, very, very. So <laughs> here's here's what, what the treatment had. The treatment uh, started with a figure rowing out on Crystal Lake. By the way, I was told by Sean to ignore Part 8 in its entirety. Part 8 doesn't exist, okay? So we, I have a figure row out onto Crystal Lake, dive backward into the water, find Jason's body chained to the bottom of the lake, as it is at the end of Part 7. He brings the body up puts it in the rowboat that he's in, rows back to shore. You All of this silhouette, you don't see the, the character. This guy drags Jason's body into one of the cabins of Camp Crystal Lake, and we see that he set up this janky, horrible-looking operating theater inside one of the cabins. He then starts to operate on Jason's body, tears open his chest plate, and finds the black heart of Jason Voorhees. He then goes to extract the heart and the heart, you start to see like black ooze start to kind of come out from it. And suddenly the heart starts beating and Jason's eye opens, his one eye. Jason sits up, grabs the face of the person who's wearing surgical mask, grabs his face and rips the mask off. And we see under this mask, this hideous boil covered pustule figure, just fucking gross and Jason starts to crush his skull, okay? The guy who's getting his head crushed, this ends up being Elias Voorhees, who is not Jason's father. He's Jason's brother, okay? This is where all this Elias shit started. So it's his brother, and the two of them end up in this death battle with Elias trying to pull Jason's heart out and Jason trying to crush Elias's head, okay? Okay. Elias yanks the, the, the heart out. Jason falls dead on the table. Heart still beating in Elias's hands. Elias performs a ritual and eats the heart. Okay. What we find out is that Pamela Voorhees had two children, two sons. One was smooth and perfect, and that was her Jason. The other was a genius, but was hideous to look at. And so she shunned Elias, but loved her Jason. And this set up a sibling rivalry that lasted Elias's whole life. So when, when Pamela's dead, Jason's dead, and he can go get Jason's evil heart, he finds a way that by consuming his brother's heart, he will, he will gain his brother's power. And again, you know, with the whole Deadite thing and everything else that, 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 that you know, has come out in the last year or so, finally, because I finally started talking about it, Give us a little insight on the whole Jason is a deadite thing. And were there any aspirations of maybe one day crossing over with Ash? Give us the background on that real quick. Honestly, from my point of view, there was never any aspirations of crossing over with Ash. So I'll, I'll start right from there. That was not my intention. My intention was I wanted to find a mythological way that was in the horror universe 
okay? But when you watch Jason Goes to Hell, I put in, and again, everybody thinks of Easter eggs as a common thing. When I did it, it was not common. I wanted to cross the streams. I wanted to kind of bring these characters closer together. And look, you know, the ending was not something dictated by New Line or by Sean. I'm the one who came up with the ending. I'm the one who said, let's have Freddy drag Jason to hell. That was me. So much so, I had to go to, I had to be deposed for uh, testimony in court about it. That's no joke. So I'm the guy who came up with that. When it came to the Evil Dead thing, I was hanging out with Bob Kurtzman on the set of Army of Darkness when we were just before we were starting pre-production on Jason Goes to Hell. So I was there for a bunch of it. And after that, I actually shadowed Sam on a couple of commercials that he shot because I was interested in doing some commercial directing on the side for money. So when Sam and I got to talking, you know, I told him how important Evil Dead was to me and how important that film was as a, as a filmmaker and how it, it, it affected me to, to make those kinds of films. And he loved that and blah, blah, blah. So I said to Bob, I said, listen, when we were putting stuff in the movie as, you know, quote unquote Easter eggs, I said, look, I have this idea, but I know New Line can't say anything about the Evil Dead because they don't own it. They can't they can't cross that stream. But is there any way that I could get the Necronomicon from Sam to put in the movie? Is the knife also inspired a bit by Evil Dead? Yes, it, 100%. 100%. Because the reason the Book of the Dead is in Pamela Voorhees' house is because when I was a little boy, I watched the Evil Dead. It scared the shit out of me. And immediately I said, okay, so that's the book that resurrects the dead. That's what it does. And my concept was Pamela Voorhees used the Necronomicon to resurrect her son. And that's why her son is able to live underwater for 30 years, grow three feet in a few weeks, find Alice, kill Alice, drag her body back, make a shrine, survive all of this, come back as a zombie, blah, 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 is that Jason is a deadite. That's how I woke up every morning and went to set making something that I could logically believe in. Because otherwise, I'm making a wrestling movie. And I wanted to make a movie about, about a character that made sense, even if it's just in a horror, a horror universe. It made sense then. So that was why the, and by the way, that's why the dagger is there because I wanted to know how am I going to kill this guy with all of that backstory that I wanted to include in this movie because look here's the thing about Jason it doesn't make any sense and I love when people look at my movie and go well that doesn't make sense I'm like really it doesn't okay so hang on so actually having some kind of black magic around this character makes less sense than a little boy who drowns in the 50s who then emerges from the lake in the early 80s, and he is still a little boy. Then a few months later, he grows several feet. He learns how to drive, learns how to find out where somebody lives, drives out to Alice's house, kills her, drags Alice's body back with him to the lake, makes a shrine. Five years later, they try to open the camp again and all the, 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 the craziness of, of, of part two happens. Then he's murdered in part four. Finally, we get rid of him after he's been, you know, chopped, diced, and sliced a thousand times, but we kill him in part four. Then another guy shows up in part five who has a photograph, a close-up photo of Jason from a newspaper clipping in his wallet because who took the picture? Was it the last picture they ever took? And how did they find the film? Then, part six, he's resurrected by the kid who killed him in part four, but he's resurrected with a stake through his heart, vampire style that happens to get hit with, a, with lightning, which turns Jason into zombie Jason. Then he fights Carrie, and then he takes a boat ride to Montreal. That's all believable, but having his mother make a deal with the devil, ostensibly, uh, Evil Dead style, that seems far too outlandish for the hardcore guys who love the hockey mask. This is the stuff that I'm constantly shocked by, because for me, I kept saying... <laughs> I, and again, I love these movies. I went to every one of them in the theater many times. I love these films. And 
I, as a 13-year-old, when I went to see Part 2, went, that doesn't make any sense. What? And I was 13. It's constantly feeding an audience just this anemic story weight so that we can get to the only thing that people seem to really give a shit about, which is how many teenagers can we murder in gross ways? Well, you know what, man? If that's all a horror fan wants from their movie, well, then they deserve what they get, I guess. But I, 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 I'm, I'm the kind of horror fan that wants smart, scary, cool, mythology-based films that actually have something to say. I, I, I just, I don't understand. Look, I, I, again, Give me, you know, my bloody Valentine all day long. But give me a story. Give me Prom Night. Give me Terror Train. Give me all those movies. I love those movies. But give me a fucking story. Look, the first Friday 13th has a great story. It's just a great, simple mystery. And when Mrs. Voorhees shows up at the end of that movie, no one saw that coming. No one. And it makes perfect sense. When you know the story, you go, that makes, uh, makes all the sense in the world. The other thing is the idea of this serial killer murdering over a hundred people in less than a square mile of space over 10 years and they've never called the feds they let the local sheriff deal with it what world are we living in and if horror movies aren't based in some kind of reality then they're not really scary because they're as real as a disney cartoon so how is that scary anymore so for me, you know, it was why it was so easy to blow up Jason at the beginning of the movie. Because I went, yeah, the FBI would have been called in years ago. And this guy keeps evading any kind of capture. And they're going to blow him the fuck up. They're going to do a sting operation. And it works. And it's successful. And again, what I loved about screenings of Jason Goes to Hell even back then, people would lose their minds when we blew up Jason. People went out of their minds. And then there was this moment of, wait a minute. We're only seven minutes into the movie. What the fuck? Which was great, because I'm like, great, it's the first time in a Friday 13th movie you don't know what's coming. You have no idea where I'm going at this point. How much freedom did you really have? You said at first you seemed like you had a lot, but then things receded a bit. Yeah, I, I had a lot of freedom in the treatment of the first story, and forgive me, I, I went off course with that, because the, basically the story was about Jason's brother stealing Jason's ability, J Jason's power, and then Elias becomes much worse than Jason ever was. Because now we've got Jason in the body of someone who's a thinker, who's brilliant, okay? So I wanted to make kind of uber Jason by putting him and his brother in the same body. The problem is the body starts to deteriorate. That Jason, because Elias is so weak, is so is such a weak character. He's so diseased physically that the body just starts to break down. So that's where the body hopping came in. That he needs to keep moving because the tissue is literally tearing apart. Because Jason is in there trying to get out. So the body hopping came from that. It was a much, much darker movie. It was, it was, I mean, there were things in there, dude, that I can't believe I wrote at that time. Like, really angry, ugly, ugly stuff. And Sean was like, okay, this is all interesting, but... <laughs> so, the next thing I did was I, I, I started to create sort of what ended up becoming Jason Goes to Hell... But the difference was that the character that John D. LeMay plays, um, Stephen Freeman, that character didn't exist. It was Tommy Jarvis. The problem is we didn't buy Tommy Jarvis from Paramount, and I didn't know that. So I couldn't have Tommy Jarvis, but that's who it was originally supposed to be. So Stephen was as close to Tommy as I could get him, but I couldn't have Tommy. So I was like, okay, great. So just so our audience knows at that time, like we said earlier on, New Line just bought Jason pretty much, correct? That's, That's it. it. That's it. They were able to use anything that was in the first, that was established in the first film, including Cam Crystal Lake, so on and so forth. They could not use, but they couldn't use the title, Friday the 13th. They could not use anything that had been created after the first film, except for things specific to Jason Voorhees. So the hockey mask was fine, all of that was fine, but we couldn't use characters or proper names from anything else. Sounds like the studio didn't really have too many guidelines, right? It was more or less they did not Sean, I'm assuming, they did not was the one who had... Yes. Okay, so let's get into what happened there as far as like more specifics, because uh, mm -hmm. you, you did bring up the one incident. Is there any other ones that kind of come to mind that were really stick out? Well, Sean, I think Sean was nervous about making a movie that was... Um, that would get so ugly. I mean, the funny thing is, the stuff I wanted to do with the movie is stuff that now 
people would be like, oh yeah, that's fucking cool. Back then, not so much. There were, you know, sexual themes and other stuff that were really ugly that Sean uh, shied away from. And by the way, I don't think he was wrong. I, I, I really don't. I, I loved my dark version of this movie. If I made the dark version of my film now, I think it would be incredibly successful because I think the audience is ready for it. At that time, I don't know if they were. I really don't. You know, I think that The Evil Dead, when it came out, was uh, spectacular. It's one of my, my favorite films. I love that film. I don't think if Sam had made the remake of Evil Dead as the original Evil Dead, I don't think the audience would have been okay with it. I don't think they would have accepted it. I think it would have been too extreme. And they would have been like, what the hell is this movie? This is, this is who, what pornographer made this, you know? Because back then, dude, I mean, when you look at the video nasties of that time, the stuff that got banned in, in England, bro, it's it's tame compared to what we've done since then. Oh, yeah. Even stuff that you've done in Jason Goes to Hell is quaint in, by today's yes. standards, that's for sure. Yes. I mean, look, the body, the, 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 the body split is still, for my money, go ahead, bring it on. Show me a worse death than a Friday 13th that doesn't exist. We went for it, but here's the thing, and I will say this about New Line at the time, because New Line was amazing. I mean, I, look, you have to remember, my executives were Mark Ordesky and Mike DeLuca. Mike DeLuca was ostensibly running the company before he was 30. And the guy was like, uh, he was amazing. Very prominent name in New Line, yeah. Right, and Mark Ordesky is the guy responsible for the Lord of the Rings movies. I mean, these guys are the shit. And those are my executives. So they were so supportive and so in love with what I was doing. It was really exciting stuff. So here's the thing. New Line wanted me to make as violent a movie as I could make. They knew I was going to get cut down. They knew the MPA was going to go nuts. But what I didn't know was why they wanted this. Because originally I was told, well, the, the foreign market, you know, wanted all of the blood and guts. Absolutely. Like they wouldn't cut anything and they never did. But... New Line, unbeknownst to me, was going to release a rated and unrated cut of the film. It was the first time New Line had ever done that. And it's why it was New Line's most successful title up until then. Because every mom and pop shop that usually bought one copy or two copies had to buy two copies or four copies of the same movie in two different cuts. You said you didn't know about it as you were making it. Uh, I showed you a picture of a Fangoria Jason Goes to Hell special magazine that yes. I have on. Yes. And they talk about this fact in that magazine, and there's even stuff that's mm -hmm. mentioned in the magazine that didn't wind up in the cut. What what happened there? Look, I made a movie that is well over two hours long. The, my first cut was over two hours. And by the way, it was boring as shit. It was so slow and so boring. Oh, my God. So after the first screening of the movie, we were like, okay, we have a lot of work to do. We all knew that. Fine. But after that, when we started really cutting the thing down, well, New Line wanted to get as many screenings as possible per day. When you cut a movie to under 90 minutes, you get an extra screening every day, which is just a ton more money. And by the way, they are right when it comes to the theatrical release of a movie. I get it. I do. The problem is there is stuff that's on the cutting room floor for Jason Goes to Hell that is shit that the fans have been asking for for 25 years. Right, yeah, and that's one thing that the, I know some of our younger listeners may not understand is that this came out at a time where it wasn't a practice that was normal for the studios right. at all. We didn't have the unrated versions of DVDs right. coming out every other week. That's so right. This was a big deal. I do recall that quite a bit. Yep, yep. And uh, look, there are effect scenes that went away. There are full characters that disappeared from the movie. And that sucks because I had great actors. Look, you know, and, uh, even people who hate Jason Goes to Hell, when I, when I asked them, you know, like what they hated about it, what they like about it, consistently, no one ever takes any umbrage with any of the acting in the film. In, the actors in my movie did an un believable job. They are all really good. I mean, the work is really good. These are, I mean, my favorite scene in Jason Goes to Hell is when John LeMay meets with Ward in the back room of, in the, in, you know, in the, in the stock room of the, of, of the diner. And it's this quiet scene where a buddy gives his friend the keys to his car and says, get out of here. But it's, it's an actual moment of drama, of actual human interaction and drama in a Friday the 13th movie. Well, nobody can fault you, yeah, for trying to do something different than teenagers screwing in the woods, Absolutely. basically. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and the thing is, you know, look, my actors rehearsed with me for a month before we ever shot one frame of film. That's never happened on a Friday 13th movie. Never, ever, ever. It's never happened. So 
I, I wanted my cast to feel like I was not hiring them as, you know, chum. I was hiring them because I think they're great actors. So, you know, for me, that's really what um, what that movie, what the core of the movie had to be. So when they cut a ton of the drama out, when they cut things like Creighton Duke, you know, his backstory monologue, which is hilarious and nuts, like everything about Creighton Duke. That's the stuff that, um, that sadly is still missing from the film. And I know there was, you know, there was a petition a couple years ago, uh, to try to get Warner brothers to let me do a director's cut. And I, and I put it out there. I said, look guys, if, if everybody wants me to do one, I'll do it for free. I don't even care if I'm paid. I just want to, I want to actually make that happen. So Still waiting. Still waiting on, on Warner Brothers. And at least it's not as labor intensive as it used no. to be either with digital nowadays too. So by the way, what I could also do is fix things digitally that you couldn't do back then that would cost nothing. Right. That would have cost thousands of dollars right. back then, or if not hundreds of thousands of dollars. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Because look, one of the things that I wanted originally and was originally the concept was that as people's bodies were coming apart because of the evil that's in them, I wanted the hockey mask to start emerging under their skin. So I wanted this really cool effect of Jason trying to break free from the human host that he's in. So that's what I initially wanted. But of course, we couldn't afford it. It was just way too expensive an idea because you had to do a practical. You couldn't do it digitally. There was no digital. Right. Because before this, at this point, New Line's biggest film would have been Freddy's Dead, correct? Absolutely. What people don't realize about, about Jason Goes to Hell was how low budget it was. Um, I, I have to tell you, the, the, one, the, the thing that is remarkable about Sean Cunningham, the thing that I will give him, and I've always said about him, Sean is a remarkable producer because he can turn a dime into a dollar. He can. He's he's incredible when it comes to that. It was never a feeling of, I don't have enough money. That was never the sense. It really wasn't. And look, let's be honest. I mean, you know, Bob Kurtzman, who to this day is still one of my best friends and, and does the effects on my movies. Bob, I mean, <laughs> Greg Nicotero never stopped yelling at Bob during our film because Bob kept adding effects that we weren't paying for that Bob would just do. And Greg would be like, Greg's like, you're going to bankrupt our shop on this movie. So a ton of the stuff that Bob was doing, Bob was doing for cost because he loved me and he loved the movie. And so, I mean, dude, we, we, we had, when you look at that movie, look how many deaths are in that film. I mean, it's out of control. And that's just Bob. That's me and Bob coming up with shit late at night and him getting it constructed. It's literally what it is. When did things start becoming a bit more constrictive? Like when did Sean kind of start stepping in and saying, well, and changing I gotta tell things you, he, he didn't change a lot of stuff on set. That didn't really happen because I got to tell you, I mean, the movie was pre-produced. We, we worked on the script and pre-produced for over a year. So the constrictive stuff all happened during the actual writing process and the pre-production process. So what went down was that, you know, whenever we would, whenever the script would get unwieldy, whenever I would be asking for too much, even in the writing, Sean would try to figure a way either to make it work on our budget or to reel it back. When it came to the drama of the movie, that stuff all got constricted after the film because Sean was all for the drama, because Sean loved the, that, that it was a movie about human interaction. He loved that it wasn't about a bunch of teenagers who go to get high and get killed. It was about real people with real lives that get interrupted by the horror of this shark in the water. And he loved that. So it wasn't until Sean wanted to cut the movie down below 90 minutes that it started strangling the drama of the movie and making choices that, you know, some I agree with and some I don't agree with. But Sean's constrictive work as a producer, I, I will say for a lot of the movie, look, he, he definitely let us be kids in a sandbox. He definitely let us have some toys and have some fun and do all of that. But I'll tell you, I walked on to set my first day with a shot list that had 47 shots on. And he looked at me like, um you can do half of those. Right. And again, you know, people forget this is, I shot this movie on 35 millimeter. There was no digital. <laughs> it took forever to light. It took forever to set up a shot. And I had an amazing crew and an amazing DP. And again, my inexperience told me I could do 47 shots in a day. Yeah, on a student movie where I've got a crew of five people, sure. 
but not when you're moving 100 people and vehicles and every other goddamn thing. So by day three, my shot list was down to 20, 22 shots. Here's what's incredible, okay? I would come in with a regular shot list, and then I would start adding. <laughs> I would get my 22 shots, and then I would start adding shots to the day. By the time we finished, I had an average, this is no joke, of 41 shots a day. That's the truth. And my cinematographer will be the first one to jump up and say, he's absolutely right. So what happened was my youthful enthusiasm, my excitement started to take hold and started to get us to work faster and more efficiently and move. Dude, I'm telling you, like when I'm on set uh, and anyone who's been on set with me can attest to it. When I'm on set, I never stop moving. I never sit down and have lunch. I'm not that guy. I am, I am on it the whole fucking day because I go, look, if I've got, and on that movie, I had, a, I had a healthy schedule. I had 35 days. If I've got 35 days, I don't want to sleep for a minute of those days. I want to be working as much as I possibly can. And the truth is crews, the only reason that a lot of crews go slowly is because they're fucking bored. Set is boring. Being on set is such a dull experience unless you are willing to work your ass off. And the truth is, most people who work in film, they want to work their ass off. Like, they want to have a good time and do their job and have fun doing it. And so for me, the environment that I tend to create is one that's very positive and very excited. If a PA wants to give me a suggestion, I am happy to hear it. So the film really mm -hmm. got taken away from you in post production, yes, is what you're kind yes, of saying. So, so tell us a little bit about that then. So you got the film shot. You, you're insinuating that you that you could pretty much put together the version you wanted to do. It's out there. Yes. But you just need the ability to do it. So now you, you're into post production. Sean's trying to cut it down to 90 minutes. What happened there? Sean basically tells me to sit in the editing room and shut my mouth and look pretty. I swear to God. <laughs> and and you know I tried to voice my thoughts and my opinions and was shut down almost every single second. What were some of the major changes that bothered you the most? Well, I mean, Creighton Duke not getting his backstory in is infuriating to me. Also, there were scenes in the diner where we really got to know those characters better, especially Vicky and Randy. Vicky had a boyfriend who was an amazing actor named Jonathan Penner. His entire character was cut out of the film. And he was killed. He was killed in the movie. And he got cut out of the film. They cut the, 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 the death scene. You got to know Ward and his parents better. You just had more of a sense of the fabric of this place. And again, I'm not saying that all the cuts were bad. A lot of the cuts were really good. A lot of the cuts were smart, judicious cuts, but we lost the flavor of the town that we had created where you really got to know and care about these people. So for me, is some of that there? Yes. Is enough of it there? No. Because for my money, the only reason that you're actually frightened when somebody gets murdered is if you know them and love them. And I think there are some characters in there that are, look, I mean, Joey B and Pookie are two of the most, you know, adorable, hilarious, ridiculous characters. They're awesome. And the performances are amazing. So you attach yourself to people who are kind of funny. But I got to tell you, man, I mean, there were there were scenes of real drama in this movie. And look, by the way, there's you know the whole subplot about this guy has a baby that he doesn't know exists. No one has told him he has a child. That's in the movie. We shot that stuff. But you don't get to have any moment of it. So when he's fighting for the life of his child, that child is a cipher. It's not, it's not something that he's grappled with. But he did grapple with it in the footage. Look, the other part of it is, anyone who ever watches the cut version of this movie, I look at them and go, why are you wasting 89 minutes of your life? Because... If you don't see every effect that we put in that movie in its entirety, you are missing the point of the movie. Because the effects, the effects are extraordinary. And look, here's the other thing. Sean Cunningham was public enemy number one when it came to the MPAA. So right, right. that was one of the worst things that could have happened to me as a filmmaker, because the minute I worked for Sean, I got branded with that same problem. So the first time we sent the movie into the MPAA, they didn't finish the movie. They turned it off. Wow. They called Sean and said, "This we don't even want to give this an X. That was their quote. 
So we started cutting willy nilly because the MPAA never tells you what to cut. They just no, call they it can't. right yeah. cumulative effect. We're not filmmakers. Oh, for God, I, I, this is this is uh, the system is so fucking wrong. It's so. And by the way, talk about something that's antiquated. With the age of Netflix and Shutter and Hulu, you can put anything you want unrated, and a million children are going to see it so much easier than if they had to sneak into a movie theater. For God's sakes! Right. And we still have this ridiculous rating system. Oh yeah, yeah. That's a whole nother subject altogether. But yeah, definitely, these films, like you said, have always had issues with the rating system. But that's just insane. No one, no one goes, no one goes to Friday Thirteenth to see Bambi. Nobody stumbles into the theater and goes, "What the hell is this?" Exactly. So obviously, you're you're you know doing a hack job on anything you can to to try and get the rating to, or at least get it right. to a rating. Right. Anyway. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. To just get a rating. So, again, you know, the film got chopped up pretty severely. And that is the movie business. Like, that's not just Sean. That's not New Line. That's just the movie business. That is the way things work. Right, right. So I got it. I understood it. But I never felt like my version of that movie ever got seen. No. No, it didn't. And I made a better movie. That's, you know, that's frustrating. But again, look, I'm still proud of the movie that's out there. The, the uncut version I'm proud of. The cut version, I think, is ridiculous. But the uncut version of the movie I'm very proud of because I go, look, you know, we swung for the fences with a story that was challenging, um, with characters that were complete human beings, uh, with great effects, great acting, great music. I mean, we, we did a lot to really construct a cool movie for people. And by the way, even its detractors... When you usually get into it with them and you go, okay, wait, so if this wasn't a Friday 13th movie, what would your opinion be? Oh, no, then it's badass. Between Jason X and Jason Goes to Hell, they are kind of the the films that the fans tend to, mm -hmm. beat up. you know, beat up quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And and how does that make you feel in the end? I mean, really, it's like... <laughs> And, and do you feel like if, if your version could have been put out there that, that the audience may have been a little bit more receptive to it? I think that if uh, if I'd been able to do the gag that I wanted to do about the, the mask p bursting through people's faces, I think the audience would have totally dug it, and I think that would have changed the movie. I think I made a movie, being a fan, I made a movie that a fan wanted to see. Okay, I made a movie that was more challenging and it still had the fucking hockey mask in it. It is still, look, by the way, Jason is on screen more in my film as hockey mask Jason than in most of the other films combined. He has a lot of screen time in my movie, like a ton. Jason is in the entire movie. He just happens to be in different, uh, with different masks on. That's really what it is, okay? Mask aside and Jason aside, though, how do, how, do you, how do you feel people respond to the whole familial change in the backstory a little bit being reworked a little bit and, and adding and all that kind of stuff? Do you, again, do you ever have people bring that up to you? Yeah, it, it, it comes up. And again, look, I, I'm happy to debate that stuff all day long because that's, look, that's opinion on mythology and I totally get that and I dig it. I think that's all cool. Like, that doesn't bother me. When people just complain about the fucking mask, I want to look at them and go, listen, go back to watching wrestling because that's actually what you want to be watching you don't want you don't want horror movies you want a wrestler you, you you're you're not interested in what the movie's about you're you just want a mask which is just stupid i totally understand <coughs> hardcore fans and i say to them listen you have part three through part eight then you've got <laughs> jason x you've got the remake you've got freddy versus jason you've got a ton of movies with a hockey mask in them enjoy them they're there for you there's a ton of hockey masks my film is a horror movie, plain and simple. It is a mythological horror film. It takes the Voorhees story into new directions so that there's something to talk about rather than, I mean, let's be honest. I mean, you know, come on, look at the remake. Come on. I mean, I'll come honest, on. I'm not a fan of the remake at all. Well, so... by, the way, by the way, here's the funny thing. Most people aren't. They might like, you know, the actor who played Jason and it is, you know, he did a terrific job, but he ain't Kane hotter. And that's, and, and by the way, that's totally legitimate. And if it bumps you, it bumps you. And that's totally cool. I don't look, I, I, I don't begrudge anybody their opinion. All I say is, look, take it for what it is. It's a chapter in a series that up till that point didn't challenge anybody in any way from an intellectual standpoint at all. And again, I wanted to make a darker movie without a doubt. I also want to make a more character driven film, but look, uh, the problem with these movies and the problem, look, honestly, the problem with the audience for all this stuff, 
at this point, let's be honest. And and I mean, look, you know, you, you guys are look, you, you're you've taken your love of these films and film in general in a professional uh, route towards something that is that is a forum where you're really having discussion with filmmakers and and all that. My problem is is that I start I start feeling like if the internet, if every person's opinion starts to count as much as every person thinks it should count, you're going to end up with the crappiest, lousy movies possible. Because well, we're kind of getting there in some instances. Well, no, we, <laughs> yeah. we we really are. I mean, honestly, how many you know how many paranormal activities can we take? How many? of that mold can we take dude hereditary is the best reviewed horror movie of the year by a landslide okay now i saw the film i have very complicated feelings about the movie the way the fans are reacting dude it's got a d plus cinema score and it's not that movie do you think it's just because it's not the traditional stuff they're used to? Is that the case? I think it's. I think that's part of it. Look, do I think that Hereditary was maybe marketed in a way that's a little bit dangerous? Yes, I do. I think the problem is the minute you call anything the scariest film since The Exorcist, you've totally fucked that movie. You fucked the movie because that is a bar. You are setting the bar so high that unless the film really is scarier than The Exorcist, everyone's going to be let down. There's no way not to be let down. But dude, let down doesn't equal eviscerate. Right. And these movies constantly get eviscerated. And I'm scratching my head going, wait a minute, guys, if we keep looking, you know what? Okay. I know there's a lot of people who hate Rob Zombie's films, right? I know there's a lot of people, especially the Halloween remakes. I like the first one. <laughs> yeah, but by the way, do, do I think that remaking Halloween is not the best idea in the world? Yeah, I think that's not a great idea. By the way, look, bro, I hope the new Halloween is fantastic. I am, I am definitely excited for it. But how can it live up to any of the hype around it? How? How is it possible? Yeah, and you have that everywhere, especially with things like Star Wars and stuff like right. that now. And right. So, was there anything you would go back and do over again? Is there anything you have done differently looking back on it? Because when the film came out, it obviously was a financial success. Uh -huh. So, when did it finally start to come back as far as any backlash or anything like that? And the internet. When did you kind of just... The yeah, internet. That's the what birth, I figured. The birth, <laughs> the birth of the internet and when every, you know, look, when every person has a voice... And when hating things becomes more entertaining than liking things, that's when it happened. Um, what I think is awesome is that the last five, six years, suddenly critics and fans alike all start showing up on the internet, writing these great articles in defense of Jason Goes to Hell. And it's really cool because there is this wave of people who love the movie, who get what I was trying to do. People are starting to realize like, I had something on my mind and up my sleeve that was a little more complicated than just another chapter in the Friday 13th franchise. And what's cool about the people who are defending the movie is they are realizing, hey, in a, you know, in a wave of hate, the cool thing is to be the person who's positive about it. So that's been kind of amazing. And I will tell you, I mean, I've been doing a bunch of screenings around the country for the movie for its 25th anniversary. Every audience is sold out. Look, if if I was able to do it now and in the world that that exists as we can as we are able to manipulate uh, uh, photography the way we can, look, I wish that I was able to do something with the mask that kept reappearing much more often for the fans. I think that's the part that bumps them the most. Do I wish the mythology was different? No. No, I like my mythology. Quite frankly, I wish I could have had the rights to Evil Dead. I wish I could have done something that was more along the lines of that because those movies... Look, there's a, there's a fear factor in that first film, uh, I'm saying Evil Dead, that you match that with, with Jason Voorhees, you suddenly have a monster that's far more terrifying and that there's a reason you can't kill him. For me, making Jason just the shark, well, that's fine. That's fine. It's okay. Um, but let's remember, Jaws 1 is the only good Jaws movie. After that, it's diminishing returns. 
it was in like development hell forever when it came to Jason and yeah. Freddy getting yeah. together on the screen, even though that was, I'm sure, the biggest motivation for New Line buying the character in the, the first problem. place. Yeah, which, by the way, by the way, just so you know, I didn't know that when they bought the character. And when they brought me out of the film, there was never a discussion of that. So when it came up, when I, when I came up with the ending for the movie, the people at New Line were psyched, but they did right. not go, great, because our master plan is to put these guys in the same movie. They never said that. They said it after the movie, and I went in to pitch. They brought me in to pitch a version of Freddy vs. Jason right at the beginning of that development. Right, and how did your pitch different than what we got? Oh, God, much different, much different. It started with the two of them in hell. You, what you find out is that Jason and Freddy are hell's assassins and that there's only room on Earth for one of them. So they both end up, they both end up back on this plane, and they basically, it's about who can get Tommy Jarvis and, and, uh, and Nancy from A Nightmare on Elm Street. And whoever gets them, whoever can kill those two characters gets to stay on Earth. The other one goes to hell forever. And it was a battle royale. And in fact, uh, I pitched bringing back Creighton Dew. Now you just revealed that you are working on a Creighton yes. Duke film. Tell us all about that. Um, here's, what here's the thing. Here, okay. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Finish your finish your question. Well, I was just gonna say, what can you tell us as far as is it in development? Is there yeah. anybody attached to it? Is yeah. it really a thing? Uh, obviously, is it connected to Friday the Thirteenth at all? Mm -hmm. Okay, here's what I can tell you about our Creighton Duke movie. Uh, a couple years ago, I created a new company called Skeleton Crew. Skeleton Crew was the brainchild of myself, my brilliant writing partner, Deborah Sullivan, and uh, my, my equally brilliant producing partner, Brian Sexton. What we're trying to do is, much like what I talked about earlier, is make films that are fun for the audience, but that also challenge them intellectually and actually have something to say. I have been developing a project that is based on a character much like Creighton Duke, and this is what I said originally, who is inspired tremendously by the ideas that allowed Creighton Duke to be created in the first place. I love that character. Fans, uh, even fa people who don't love Jason Goes to Hell, but people who, who, people who have seen the movie, everybody always seems to love Creighton Duke. Creighton Duke is one of those guys that is just really badass and exciting and fun. We have a project we've been developing for the last couple of years that is um, Creighton Duke adjacent. Let's call it that for the moment. I cannot talk about attachments to the movie yet. What I can tell you is that we are dead serious about it. That it will. That it's that the concept of uh, a bounty hunter of uh, all things that go bump in the night is something that we are very turned on by it is something that we are committed to and it is a project that i am madly in love with and will make and it's a very political movie it's a very when i say political uh it's more about um socioeconomic politics are you planning on writing and directing it yourself or you can't say right now i am writing it that's happening but uh whether i direct it or not we will we'll, we'll we'll see so you're still working on getting funding and all that kind of stuff or Yes, well, but again, our company, it's, it, that's complicated, but it's, our, our company is funded in, in a couple of different ways, and we have different divisions of the company, so. So you, so, are, you said adjacent to, so is that, are, to be clear, does that mean you cannot use the name Creighton Duke? Uh, it, 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 let's put it this way. We haven't even tried to negotiate for it because it's, because honestly, that's just a nightmare. Uh, uh, for, for my money, um, you know, we, I made a movie many moons ago about this awesome bounty hunter. The concept of a bounty hunter is in the public domain. Um, it does not preclude me from doing what I want to do as far as something, something that I'm inspired by, by my own work. Um, so, uh, it, you know, it's much it's more about possible. the inspiration. Absolutely. And the whole point is um, there are things that can make this more Creighton Duke-like, um, and more an homage to the character um, that will satisfy the hardcore fans. But let's be honest, look, dude, 
uh, I'm not expecting, uh, you know, a, a character that showed up for one Friday the 13th movie to suddenly set the horror world on fire. That's nuts. What I am expecting is that the people who love the movie will see something that harkens back to the feeling they had about that guy. And for the, for the uninitiated fan or for the new fans, it's about a character that was badass then and that I know I can reconstruct to make him badass now. Uh, so if the option's open, would you have Stephen Williams come back, or is that kind of off the table and you're looking to no, no, no. The reboot option, the whole project? If, no, if the option is open, I would absolutely have Stephen Williams back as Creighton Duke. Absolutely. Because Stephen is uh, one of the best actors I've ever worked with. I love Stephen. I love Stephen. Um, he's an amazing guy, and he is as skilled as you can ask when it comes to uh, a performer. He's just a brilliant guy. Do you have a distribution deal in the works or anything like that yet, or...? Well, again, not no, no. We don't. What we do is, uh, especially with our horror stuff, we do everything independently, completely independently, and then we set up distribution in different markets. So, with Secret Santa, for example, we just closed our our UK distribution on Secret Santa. We are closing our German distribution next week. We are in the middle of something with the US. So things are structured differently now. In our bigger budget division, which is more action pictures and thrillers, that kind of stuff. That usually we end up with an MG with a you know from a studio. But again, part of the reason behind Skeleton Crew was that I had been doing you know sort of studio filmmaking for a really long time, which is awesome, and I'm very lucky to have gotten the jobs that I've gotten and worked on the films that I've worked on, and that's been amazing. The problem is you go to see the premiere of the movie and you kind of scratch your head and go, huh, I didn't write that. What is that? So what doors did Jason Goes to Hell open up? Well, what it did was it opened up every horror sequel that could possibly be opened up. And uh, the funny thing is, my first meeting, literally the Monday after Jason Goes to Hell came out, was with Francis Ford Coppola at Zoetrope. I mean, the movie had real fans. Robert De Niro had me out to New York for a meeting because of this movie. So when Jason Goes to Hell opened, it garnered a lot of attention, which was great. The problem is everybody wanted to have me do a movie that had a part number at the end of it, which is fine, but I didn't want to do Pumpkinhead 2. Right. Because the next time you would really jump into the major horror franchise would have been with Texas Chainsaw 3D, which would have been yes. the reboot. Reboot yes. well. Reboot cool. How would you? Yes, <laughs> exactly. No, here's the thing. What what happened was um, I, I immediately started to feel the box close on me, and I had just been working with Sean Cunningham, who truly had a box around him. And I said, I, I don't want to be that guy. I don't want to be a guy with a with a number after every movie he makes. So uh, I went and I made an independent film with my brother Kip that that uh, that I mentioned earlier, Let It Snow, which was very successful in getting us introduced to different outlets as far as the studios were concerned i sold five television shows inside of two years right after that film and then went on to i was writing with my wife we were still writing partners doing horror and suddenly i started selling scripts literally to every studio they, every studio in this town has a script of ours on their shelf which was you know awesome and again the money is great <laughs> The working environment's really cool. Um, I, I, you know, I enjoyed all of it. When they make the product, you just kind of go, wow, huh. I mean, for example, Texas Chainsaw, there were no cell phones in that movie. Yeah, that kind of bothered me because I'm like, it works really well on its own outside of a few anachronisms, and that's one of them. It's like, okay, if this girl's supposed to be in her 20s, this movie would take place, you know, quite a few years ago, not now. Dude, dude the movie, the movie was supposed to happen in 1993. Thank you. That's my, one of my biggest questions I had about the film, and I'm glad you said that, because other than that, I do enjoy that movie. There's yeah. a lot to it, but like you said, all of a sudden they start pulling out cell phones and stuff like no, that. No, it's and It's like you can tell they fudged some things to where they couldn't see the dates on stuff. And Dude, we wrote a script that was for a $20 million film, a $20 million shot in 3D movie. The producer, who I won't get into him but he made it so that he had to go out and find the financing he was financed he had a studio and then he didn't have a studio and he went out get the financing and he could get less than half of that so suddenly we had written a movie that was badass and crazy and big and scary and suddenly it had to become a movie that was shot for half that money well that changes things dramatically and next thing you know, they bring in somebody else to do writing, and they ignore the fact that the movie is supposed to be connected to the original film. But it is connected to the original film. Right. 
Look, here's the thing. Horror movies should be made by people who actually like the horror genre. That's it. They should be directed by people who love horror movies. They should be written by people who love horror movies. They should be produced by people who respect the audience that goes to see a horror movie. Look, I don't want somebody making kids movies who hates children. Right, it makes no sense, yeah. Right, but this is what happens a lot in our genre. It happens in our genre all the time because people go, there's money, horror makes money. So you end up with... You end up with people who don't like horror movies. Right, and as much as I can call myself a professional critic, and as much people think I hate movies, I'm actually very <laughs> generous to when it comes sure. to horror films and certain sure. other films. Sure. Because I do, I have this love of them, and I'm willing to, you know, let go of certain things. But that movie really bothered me, because, and I could tell it bothered you too, for the exact same reasons, because oh, yeah. there was something oh, there yeah. that was really like, oh, cool, they are taking it back to the old school, and, you know, and then all that weird stuff had to happen. One other thing that I will not take any responsibility for is do your thing, cuz I will not take responsibility for that line. I, can tell I will that not. Bothered. I <laughs> refuse. No, my wife and I both were like, what? And oh, by the way, at the end of that movie, it's supposed to be 12 men against Leatherface, not an overweight racist and his, and his toady. <laughs> I mean, it's it is a ridic it's ridiculous, uh, and I go, wait a minute, it doesn't cost that much money to hire eleven other extras right. and actually make this scene really seem like Leatherface is fucked. Especially when you said it was supposed to be a twenty million dollar production originally. That's kind of you betcha insane. You betcha. Yeah. So yeah, unfortunately or fortunately that you know it is a good movie. It's in some yeah, respects, and they kind of. I agree. I agree. Yeah, you it's, know, in the other it's ways, well it's well done. It's well done, and the actors are terrific. I was actually surprised at some of the performances because I, I was, I was discounting them, and then I saw the movie and went, no, 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 they're really good. That's good work. So there's a bunch I think of it's movies that I really a did. Lot, yeah, I do personally, and but as some people may say, oh, your taste is just horrible. So. <laughs> <laughs> I hear that a lot, so. <laughs> That's funny. But That's I, I do. I, I have a soft spot for that one as well. Um, is there any really cool projects that you're working on right now that you want to talk about real quick? There, or? there absolutely is. There absolutely is. We, um, I mentioned it earlier, but I've been, uh, I've been all over the world with, uh, with my current movie, Secret Santa, which is uh, not a killer Santa movie by any means. It is more a psychotic family movie. It's a movie that I'm hoping will uh, will start to uh, become people one of people's favorites around the holidays. Uh, it's the anti Happy Holiday movie, even though it is a comedy horror film. Our first festival was Sitges. We played Glasgow Fright Fest. We're playing London Fright Fest in a couple of months. The Phoenix Film Festival, the Portland Film Festival. We just won Best Picture at the Silicon Beach Film Festival. Uh, it's been unbelievable. The movie has gotten nothing but rave reviews. It's one of those prod. It's the it's the film I'm the most proud of. I made it for less money than any other film I've ever made, and I had uh, 11 days to shoot the movie. And I am telling you, I, I have never been so excited uh, about a project in my life. So let, just tell us just the quick story of the film. The quick story of the film is uh, a pharmaceutical uh, family, a family that runs a pharmaceutical empire. They have their annual Christmas Eve dinner, and everybody gets together. And of course, like all families, you know, we love our families, but they're the people who drive us the most nuts. And so we grin and bear the horrible questions, the nasty, passive aggressive behaviors. The problem is somebody on this night has chosen to, in the middle of Secret Santa, has chosen to spike the punch with a military-grade version of sodium pentothal that is untested. And first, everybody starts saying what they really feel about each other, and then everybody starts doing what they'd actually like to do to each other. And the movie is about the people who are not drinking the punch, trying to survive the people who have. Interesting. So, um, have you got a deal together for that? To I'm assuming you'll want that out near Christmas time this year. Yes. Or? Um, yes. It, uh, so far, we are already scheduled to be opening in Europe uh, in November. We are doing the same in U.S., but we're in the middle of that deal now. So, yes, that is the plan. The plan is for the movie to be out uh, around November uh, worldwide. It's the flagship movie. It's the first film coming out of Skeleton Crew. We have two television series and six other features uh, that are happening now. I'm telling you, Skeleton Crew is the most exciting thing I've ever done in my life. It's uh, it's fucking badass. 
So, uh, and a couple of our projects are bigger studio things and our TV thing is a bigger deal. So, you know, so there's that other stuff, but I will tell you for me, you know, what I wanted to do with this film and, and with this company was, you know, I've got all of these amazing friends that are in the industry that all are given, you know, tremendous money and tremendous accolades for one thing that they do. A lot of writers, I have a lot of friends that are writers, all of them want to direct, all of them want to helm their projects. But when you're a writer in our industry, a lot of times they just keep you in that box. The skeleton crew is about exploding the box and saying, fuck that, you can be who you want to be. And, and by the way, being boxed in as a writer is never a bad thing. Here's, here's what it is. It's that, look, I get getting the paycheck. The paycheck is awesome. But most people didn't get into the business for a paycheck. Most people that love movies got in to make movies they love and to make movies they really believe in. And the idea behind Skeleton Crew is to make films in, in the division that I'm talking about, which is the ultra-low division. It's sort of the Roger Corman school of filmmaking. You have X number of dollars. That's it. But there are no rules. I don't bind you. You're bound by your screenplay. You gotta, you know, what, whatever you put on the blueprint, that's your movie. But once you have that, go. Like, make your movie. And for me, look, dude, I mean, for example, you know, uh, John Esposito has been my best friend for the last 25 years. John is, um, you know, he's won the Writers Guild twice for The, for the Walking Dead. He was the producer and... <laughs> co-writer of From Dusk Till Dawn for Tarantino and, and Rodriguez. He wrote Stephen King's Graveyard Shift. I mean, this guy is, he's a badass. Dude, he's wanted to direct his whole career. No one lets him. And I'm telling you, he's the guy who should be in the director's chair. Well, he's directing a film for us next year. His first. You know, Bob Kurtzman is coming back to the director's chair with us and, um, and getting to produce things that he believes in. My composer, Tim Eilers, is a guy who, you know, has been a giant uh, prop uh, sculptor for the last 25 years. But Tim Eilers, what most people don't know, is that he is a genius composer. Well, I knew that 20 years ago. The problem is his day job took up all his time, so he never got to pursue the thing that he really wants to do. Well, guess what? Now he can. And that's that's really what Skeleton Crew is about. It's about not having any boundaries. That includes on sex, on race, on age. One of the mandates that we have is on every film, there has to be someone over 60 in a major position. We have to have as many women on screen as men on screen. We have casting that is, forget about just gender neutral, but sizest neutral. We've got characters of all ages and all sizes in our films. This is really important stuff because I want our movies to reflect our audience, not some, you know, look, I love the first remake of Texas Chainsaw. I think it's a good film. I think it's a really well done film. And I think Marcus did a really good job with that movie. My only problem with it and my problem with most films of its ilk is that it's like an Abercrombie and Fitch catalog blew up. Everybody in the movie is more beautiful than the last person in the movie. Well, that's not the way the world looks. That's bullshit. Well, and I think Scream had a lot to do with that too. I agree. I, dude, I agree. But at least Scream was making fun of the genre to some degree. I know, where, I know very few people who are not fans of Scream, but I, I totally get where that, yeah, that whole yeah. era after that, it, it changed everything, and that's why. Yeah, <laughs> Absolutely. And the problem is, is that the reason the Texas Chainsaw, the original movie, is so fucking scary is because you feel like that's you in the van. You feel like you're with those people. Yeah, it was very reflective of the teens at the time. Yeah, There you go. There you go. It looks like actual human beings. And our films are about coming back to that, is saying, wait a second, isn't it more interesting if you feel like you're in peril because you can identify with that person instead of them being some hot model? And by the way, I think there should always be pretty people in a movie. I think that's great. That's fine. But it doesn't have to be exclusively that. And honestly, you know, look, our, uh, you know, our finest actors are not based on their looks. Our finest actors are based on their acting. So for me, I want Skeleton Crew to be a safe haven for artists and for people who want to make things. And by the way, I'm not talking about some pretentious nonsense. I still want to make horror movies. I still want to make thrillers. I still want to make stuff that's audience friendly. But I want to do it in a way that allows people to actually feel really excited and good about the product they're making, not just making widgets that look pretty. Dude, you know how many television shows that there is that the casting directors are told flat out, you can't hire anybody above a size two? That's true. Right. 
That's but it should true. be more about just the actor's skills and how they portray the character and Absolutely. if they capture the character. And Absolutely. what's more important is what if bringing the page to life instead of hitting a demographic or right. Hitting, right. A, hitting a beauty quotient. Because the truth is, in that world, we don't have uh, you know a Willem Dafoe or a Kathy Bates in that world. Now, do you do you take it in stride, or is it kind of similar to the same kind of wave of diversity going on in Hollywood right now, or do you feel you're doing Dude, it in a little bit different way? I, I will tell you, what's, what's frustrating for me is that I've been doing this my whole career, and anybody who knows my screenwriting in particular knows, I have been writing for women my whole career. I have written almost exclusively for women. I write a ton of female-based action films, of female-based horror films. I have always been about that because I don't understand that, you know, in most movies, you know, it's three girls and 28 guys. And I'm including Wonder Woman in that. We're seeing a lot of films, especially like recently with like Star Wars and stuff like that, not to take up too much more right. of your time. No, but, no, um, you know, they're basically hiding behind the diversity instead of taking... taking Right. I, uh, no, I, get, I get what you're saying. I get what you're saying. Absolutely. Responsibility Absolutely. for what mm -hmm. may be wrong with the film and throwing fans under the bus and saying, oh, you're just racist or you're just... Well, no, here's you know, the thing. I think that's, I think that's nonsense. I, I agree with you on that because, look, you, you, a movie has to be good. I don't care. You can be diverse all day long. If it's not a good movie, it's not a good movie. I will say this. I watch something, let's say, like Black Panther, right? Right. And I go, this is where diversity is at its best because they're telling a story that makes perfect sense in the way that it's cast. I never felt like it was a political statement. I really right. didn't. I sat there going, this is a great movie. This is just well done. You then cut to Infinity Wars, and I go, great. Now you're just bringing that diversity into this movie, but you've established it. It's just part of the universe. It all plays out. It feels natural, out. yeah. Right, because there's a green chick who's just as important as the African-American characters in the movie. So, okay, good. We're good. Well, at that point, it almost doesn't matter. Yeah. Right, right. So... Diversity should be one of those things that just reflects the world we live in. However, there are films, and I won't get into specifics because I don't want to get hate mail. There are films <laughs> where, I, where I agree with you where diversity is being used as something where people are suddenly embarrassed to say they don't like a movie. There's a way to do this where we can all be on the journey together and actually, again, it's the idea that diversity, inclusivity, bro, do you know that, that women in a SAG contract, in a SAG contract, uh, you're consi you're, it's considered that you're hiring a minority when you hire a woman, any woman, that's not joke. That's, that's a true thing. Because there are so few parts for women, and it's one of those things that guys will never understand. We won't get it. And by the way, look, most women don't go out and support films that support women. They'll go see Wonder Woman. And again, look, the beginning, the first half hour of Wonder Woman is extraordinary. Extra I was so in love. I was like, this is, God bless these guys. This is awesome. The last two hours of Wonder Woman is captain america the first avenger thank you <laughs> with three with three women in it and by the way gail gail gadot is uh gorgeous beyond belief and in a bathing suit half the movie i love when people go she's not sexualized i'm like what movie did you see the villain is gorgeous except she's got a little piece of plaster on one side of her face and the third woman is the dumpy funny one ha <laughs> ha ha I'm like, how is this, guys, how is this a, a rally cry for women? How? Please explain it to me. Do I think it's awesome that they made a decent Wonder Woman movie? Yes, that's awesome. I think that's a great thing. But I'm sorry, Black Panther did it better, kids. Um, I don't want to take too much more of your time, but it's been a very insightful conversation with you, and I'm... I'm glad you've been very candid with this was there anything else about jason goes to hell anything about it that sticks out to you that you'd like to share about it or sure any hopes sure. for the future anything other sure. than we know that we hope we'd get your director's cut someday but well, yeah I other hope, than that I hope, we get the, I hope we get the director's cut but honestly i i hope we just get a good blu-ray of the movie at some point of the of the uncut version i, I, I hope too, we get a yeah and a um, proper special edition at least maybe Absolutely. I hope I hope that happens. And I think that that would be uh, awesome. And I think, look, for the fans that, that are out there that that want this movie and even for the people who, quote unquote, hate the movie, but have it on VHS and on DVD um, and they still hate it. 
Uh, I, I always love the people who have it in their collection, but they hate the movie. I'm like, okay, good. <laughs> just keep paying for it. As long as as long as you keep paying for it, it's going to be doing just fine. The thing that's amazing about about the movie, um, and and where I feel very grateful, even for its detractors, it's a movie that turns 25 in August. Right. We're still talking about it. I feel very grateful to every person who digs the movie and who likes the fact that I was challenging uh, the, the the status quo of the genre and of this of this character. Yes. Uh, does it you know are there things about it that are very hidden like absolutely honestly I had not seen the hidden before I wrote the movie I saw the movie I saw the hidden later and went oh my god this is so like the goddamn hidden uh, so it, it's not lost on me but I, I have to tell you on the night that Jason goes to hell opened another movie came out same weekend which was searching for Bobby Fisher. It's a remarkable film. It, it, it is written and directed by the man who made Schindler's List, who wrote Schindler's List. Um, it is, it is, an, uh, for my money, it's a masterpiece. And I paid to see Jason Goes to Hell, and I walked into the theater playing Bobby Fischer, because I was like, I've seen Jason Goes to Hell enough, I got it. I'm, I'm going to go see another movie. So I go to see Bobby Fischer, and I was blown away. Just remarkable. Dude, no one talks about searching for Bobby Fischer. It's a masterpiece. No one talks about it. But people are still talking about the thing that was across the hall which was Jason Goes to Hell and I gotta tell you that makes me feel so grateful and blessed that people still give a shit and that they want to talk about the movie and that they want to talk to me about the movie and that they want to screen the movie and that they want to go to a theater and shout and cheer and laugh and all of the things that I intended the movie to do 25 years ago are still doing to audiences now no, I'm very proud of that. That's, you know, that there's nothing negative about that. That's all positive. And even when people debate it, even when people get upset about it, I go, look, you know, who wants movies to just be these things that we eat like a cheeseburger and throw it away? For me, I'd rather have a film, whether I love it or hate it, or I'm just perplexed by it, or I've got lots of questions, or it makes me pissed off. Movies are supposed to make us feel something. And I have to say... If I can make an audience feel something 25 years later, if they can still have that excitement or emotion or get pissed off, then I'm actually doing my job of being an entertainer and bringing a piece of entertainment to an audience to make them feel. So I, I have to be proud of that, and, uh, and I'm going to remain proud of it. And it's kind of awesome. So I, you know, I love my fans. I love the people who just want to talk about the film, even the ones that don't like the film. I love everybody who engages on it because that's the best gift a, a director can get is to get an audience that actually wants to talk about the movie. Right, right. And that's why we're here today. So uh, how, how involved are you with this uh, documentary that's coming out about Jason cool. Goes to Hell? Um, I am involved. Uh, Nick Hunt came to me uh, about seven or eight months ago and said, look, I want to do this. And if you're not going to be involved, then I don't want to do it. And I went, wow, that is a good way to sell me, dude. Um, so uh, I am helping him with, you know, tons of archival stuff. I have been reaching out to cast members and crew members. Um, look, I want people to talk about the movie and I want people to be honest about the film and their feelings about the film. My actors are people that I still to this day have relationships with and that I adore um, and that I spend time with. So uh, all of that is very positive and wonderful. So, yeah, dude, I'm, I'm involved with the documentary heavily. Um, and I will be, of course, featured in the documentary talking about you know, some of the things we <laughs> talked about today, stuff we talked about today and other stuff that I haven't talked about. So it's um yeah it's it's one of those things that um i, I think it's going to be a cool thing and i think it's going to illuminate a lot of stuff for the fans um especially because they're going to be getting it from all sides i know i know kane is going to be doing it as well so uh which is awesome and, and kane is an amazing guy i adore kane and it's independently produced then so it, you guys will be able to get a little bit more candid on that i'm imagining oh yes oh yes absolutely it's 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 by no means a puff piece that's not what we're doing Awesome. I'm really looking forward to that. And hopefully we'll, whenever we hear some more news about that, we'll bring our listeners up to date about it. And maybe we'll get to Love talk it. to you again between now and then or about it again soon. If not, um, it's been a pleasure having you today with us to talk about Absolutely. Jason Goes to Hell and everything else. Awesome. Thank you so much, Adam, for taking your time to talk to us here at Midnight's Edge. And is there any place that people can find you online to check out your projects or anything like that, yes. especially if they want to check out Secret Santa or anything like that? 
Absolutely. For Secret Santa, you can go to secretsantathemovie.com. Uh, it's where the website is for the film. There you can see trailers and scenes and lots of behind-the-scenes footage and whatnot and fun stuff. Um, but we're also, I'm at Skeleton Crew Pro uh, on Instagram and Twitter, and also Adam Marcus 13 at Twitter, and just Adam Marcus on Facebook. Um, so, uh, yeah. So you can find it, you can find, and you can find any of our Project Secret Santa at all. Uh, on Facebook, just under the title, under the name Secret Santa or Skeleton Crew. Now, do you have a YouTube channel or anything to pr- promote anything? Or we actually just opened Skeleton Crew, the, the YouTube channel Skeleton Crew, and we are just starting to put content on there. So there's going to be a bunch of stuff there. We did a great thing with the Saska Sisters, who are directing a film for us. We did uh, one of the films for their Women in Horror Month in February called Nerd Girls, and that's a terrific piece that I'm very very proud of. That is going to end up being a series, a, a, a ongoing web series called Nerd Girls. Cool. Yeah. All right. Yeah. But we'll make sure to try and get all those links down below for our listeners. And awesome. again, thank you so much for your time. You spent a lot of time with us here today, and we appreciate that. And Happy to do it, brother. You were a terrific interview. Hopefully we can do it yeah. again. I look forward to it. You got it. Awesome. Thank you all so right. much. If you like this video, then please click the subscribe button. And don't forget to click the bell icon to be notified for all the latest uploaded content. Due to recent changes to YouTube's monetization policies, we'd also like to ask you to please consider supporting Midnight's Edge and its sister channel Midnight's Edge After Dark through Patreon. As thanks for their support, patrons will receive early notifications of mini documentaries, special behind the scenes making of the Edge videos, bloopers, outtakes, lost episodes, and more. You can support the channel for as little as $1 a month. Be sure to check back for news and analysis on the corporate politics behind your favorite genre movies, as well as updates and discussion here at Midnight's Edge.